Good morning, church. We've had a blast this weekend. Uh, I just need to tell you, I am from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and always a little bit reticent to head south to Texas, because I'm assuming I'm already judged before I get in the room, and I already heard the groans. But it was really good to be with your people this weekend. Your students are amazing, your staff is amazing, and Garrett is one of my favorite young youth pastors, and he is leading this group really well. But we wanted to bring the week into you. We wanted to loop you in with what we were talking about. So hi, I'm Zach Workin. I'm from Tulsa. I work for Lifeway Christian Resources out of Nashville. No, not the bookstore, the ones that made the stuff for the bookstore. And we still have lots of great things that we'd love to share and put your name on a Bible. Yeah. For some folks, that's different than others. Well, I wanted to come talk to you today about our final session this morning of what it means to live into the verse of Romans 1 of being unashamed. So in the spirit of a youth weekend, would you read it out loud with me? Can we do that as a church in an echo of voices and chorus today? Uh, The verse that has been empowering us all weekend as we talk about faith is it says this in Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Amen and amen. That is our place we're going to land, but we need to do a little bit of foregrounding before we get there to figure out how we're going to get there. So uh, this is my beautiful family. I wanted to show you a picture of them to let you know that they're really lovely, despite there's a lot of beards on stage today. Anybody else? Like, There's probably some like woodwork oil in the, I don't know, we'll talk about it later, Jay. Uh, A lot of beards, it's like the hair goes from here to here and everywhere, and that's for a different time. Uh, But my wife and beautiful sons, uh, Isaiah and Gideon, uh, would love to tell you the story of how middle school kids could fall in love right after high school and end up having two real cuties like this. Uh, They have been the light of our life and totally changed the ways in which I think about what it means to be a disciple, to be a pastor, because being a father has shaped the ways in which I think about what it means to be faithful. But I wanted them to introduce themselves to you. So our our oldest, Isaiah, is six. He's a first grader full of energy, and he loves Pokemon and parkour. Uh, Parkour is like the sport designed for elementary age boys when they've fallen out of the tree, already broken their ankle, and split their tongue open. Uh, We've now made it competitive, and we have to pay for it every month. So this is our son climbing the eight-foot wall that he is oh so proud of. Yeah, good, good, good. Kick, 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 kick. There you go. Look at that grin. (laughs) Look at that grin. So proud that he got to scale and do the thing that the kids in the big class were doing. So that's our boy, our oldest. I wanted you to meet my youngest son to know that sometimes we can have the one in the family, the member of the family who is the introvert and yet also the joy bringer. Uh, Gideon is our four-year-old pre-Kayer who will like close himself off in his room to just go read. Like some kids, when they get quiet, you get worried. Uh, When Gideon gets quiet, we just assume that he's on to his next book. He says things like, I need privacy, please. And we say, all right, man, you got it. Uh, But he also is a beacon of joy and comedic relief. And so this is a typical Saturday morning in in our house. Do that again. Just aggressive. (laughs) The bell is really important to say to you. In our house, we have a bell that you can ring that on the bell says, ring for hugs. So if you don't have one of those, grandparents in the room, pick one up. Parents in the room, get ready to have one. It's the best thing ever when you can queue up a hug or they can queue up one from you. So can't recommend it enough, uh, but that's him at about... 7.15 7.15 on a Saturday, just letting us know he's ready for some hugs. Uh, so that's my boys, and I just wanted to tell you about them, because as we talk about this weekend, we need to talk about the culture and the times that my boys and your students are living in. This has been a season of bad news. 
You don't have to go to the Planet Fitness gym at 5.30 to be overloaded by the screens with bad news. It doesn't even really matter what news station you pick. They'll still find ways to give you bad news. And if you were hoping to resort to a smaller screen on your cell phone, it doesn't matter what your chosen social media network is. They'll find ways to deliver to you bad news. They've even redesigned the algorithm so that no matter what, you get fired up and go to bed angry. We, li we live in a time of bad news. And for our students, it's really important to name to them that this is not the only news. That this is not the only thing to hear. And my invitation to you this morning, church, 20-somethings, 30-somethings, 40-somethings, 50-somethings, 60-somethings, 70-somethings, 80-somethings, 90? I believe it. They need to hear from you that the life of faithfulness is not just contained inside one news cycle. That the long view of faithfulness and good news extends way back and way beyond whatever this present condition is. And for those of you that have gathered Sunday in and Sunday out, they need that message by both your presence and your proclamation to hear that there is good news because our students are tired, exhausted, worn, thin. Um, this weekend, we talked a lot about the ways in which shame in this time has corroded our students to feeling compared at every turn. That the ways in which we have granted access and convenience at every moment has created a condition that every student is subjected to being examined, critiqued, categorized, and shamed for the things that they are, are not, or wanted to be. But we as a community of faith see both flaw and fear and welcome with faith this next generation to show them a different way. Now, I could say these words on my own, but I want to take us to the text this morning in Romans 1, and on behalf of Paul, interject some words that I think are timely for this church in this season. So if you've got your Bibles this morning, open up to Romans 1 as we talk about some of the first things first. In Romans 1 8, Paul writes to a group of people that he had not yet been with. For the last few weeks, I have been in prayer for this First Baptist Church, from my First Baptist Church, to say to you that I have heard good things about you. Paul writes this I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how I constantly remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray now at last by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to make you strong. Sisters, brothers, I have heard good things about FBC Bernie. I have been told of your faithfulness through transition and trial. I have seen in this season through reports of your pastors, the way in this congregation has been knit together in love and compassion and not fear or division. I want to commend you in that and affirm in you that the work that you're doing to stitch together generation, generation to generation, is the work of the gospel that the church must do and few will. But that is not what I've heard of you. I have heard your good work. And it's here in these verses that Paul paints for us a picture, the importance of foregrounding gratitude 
the good work I've heard in you, I believe to be true because you are a people who are grateful. Because grateful people do great things for God. Grateful people see that circumstance is not the full picture of who we are. That God has done great things, and when trials come, it does not take away the great things that God has done. It does not diminish our hope, for we are grateful. My invitation to you this morning is, in what ways can you model in this room, in this community, gratitude in all seasons? In what ways can we paint the picture that we would commend before we would critique? In what ways can we celebrate before we become cynical? This is the way and the good news that Paul declares to the Romans that I would encourage to you as a comfort of our mutual faith. I want you to be strengthened in here that this, we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you or I may have come the harvest to you among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you that are here in Rome, that we could be strengthened and encouraged by each other's faith, yours and mine. In this time, the work of the enemy is to divide. Sometimes the work of the enemy is to append or wage war, but in this season, it is to fracture and divide from a posture of gratitude, from a spirit of grace. Would you seek wholeness in the body as you pursue holiness in your own life? Would you choose as a church to seek the wholeness of who we ought to be, of every generation, of every part and member, and in that good work, represent the gospel, bear witness to a watching city, a watching world? See, the power of the gospel is this. It's good news for those who believe that transformation was beyond them. That the power of the gospel looks and says that you most unlikely are loved, seen, and welcome. This is the invitation of Jesus to scraggly disciples, hungry crowds, and sickly folk. And we as the gathered church must remember that even if that is not our present condition, that was our previous condition. That we as the church must remember that the gospel is good. It's good for the mom who feels overwhelmed. It's good for the father who feels frustrated and fist clenched. It's good for the student who sits alone and wonders if anybody else cares. It's good for the senior who's hungry for community and a place of belonging. It's good for the family that just moved in new to town because we care about all of your needs because we care about you. The gospel is good news to those who feel like they've given up, that whatever they have done or however they are addicted or broken down, that God would have no place for them. You see, the power of the gospel moves and works because it's not by our own means. We don't manage it. We don't control it. We don't own it. Here's the dangerous theology that I want to share this morning with you. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Brothers and sisters, we need to ask, who is the good news for? 
The work of faith is no work of mine. The work of faith is no work of yours. We respond to the faithfulness that was given to us. The power of Paul's writing in this chapter of this letter is that the faith you have was not first your own. You were recipient of it. And in that way, it is a gift. And in that way, we pass it on. Person to person, family to family, generation to generation. See, I think I should have introduced myself a different way. I'm a dad of two kids, but I'm a son of a children's minister. I'm the son of a piano player at church. I'm the nephew of volunteer choir leaders. I'm the grandson of Joanne who prayed faithfully every day. I'm the grandson of Alan who was the deacon that fixed every handrail in the church. And he dried drywall with a hairdryer. I'm the great grandson of farmers that brought faith to Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is like the coldest part of South Texas. <laughs> if you ever wondered about your heat, they wonder about their cold. It's just heads of cattle and freezing in the other direction. I am not here today because Garrett happened to invite me. I'm here today because there is a legacy of faith that is not my own that I'm hoping to pass on to two little boys. I'm here today to tell you that the faith that you hold dear is not yours if you clinch it. It's yours if you give it away. Amen. To the students that filled the pews this weekend, to the sixth grade girls that learned how to worship by washing you, they hear you when you pray. They see you when you sing. They live on the ways in which you live, open and honest and true. For this generation, no more compartments, no more hiding. Our faith is ours together. It's not of our own making. We don't possess it. We give it. And here Paul tells us that the unashamed power of the gospel is that, and that our righteousness will be living by that faith. So if you were hoping that you had made the transaction and secured your faithful deposit, hear me say now, it needs your interest. Week in, week out. Not just in presence, but in attention, in conversation, in connection, full of grace without shame or error, full of forgiveness and grace and truth. That the faith we hope to pass is like the stones that would be stacked. And Joshua and David and Moses, one after the other, to build something, to say something that was not our own. I leave this here to remind you of how faithful he is. This is the goodness of our God, and this is the power of the gospel. So for my parents in the room, don't just Ask them how the weekend was. Share what God is doing in your life. To my senior generation that funded and supported and made things possible, you have earned a voice more than you will ever know to share, learn, and impart wisdom with the generation that is hungry for it. They're way less scary than you think. And for whatever walls you've built up and need to climb over, do it. And for whatever announcement or bell you need to ring for this generation to hear, do it. Because the joy of the Lord and the power of the gospel 
are the things that we leave this space with to go out into our city, community, and world. It's how we bear witness. Faith to faith, generation to generation, from you to them. This is the way the gospel moves. So this morning, I'm gonna invite you to respond to that. Many of you are gathered here with someone you came with. I hope today at lunch that we have a shame-free conversation about how God is moving in our lives in church. Tell the person you came with, but tell your neighbor in row the ways in which God has moved. We're gonna sing a song, a celebration, where I invite my friend Jay to come lead us in one more song, and that we are going to worship together to bear witness in this room to the world of who we adore. There will be ministers gathered at the front. If you need someone to pray with, If you feel like in this life, you have been trapped, kept, held, cut off, this is a place of love and welcome. This is a place of grace and forgiveness. And that those that are faithful here model that not by their own self-rightness, but by the faith that has made them righteous. So you are invited this woman to pray over you in this space and invite the pastors to the front to have a moment of reconciliation, drawing power from the good news of our Jesus. Would you bow your head and close your eyes, plant your feet on the floor and maybe open your hands to receive from God this word. Jesus, you set us free. Jesus, to walk after you, to declare ourselves disciples of you, is to say to the world that would much rather leverage bad news, guilt, and shame, that even though we are not perfect, we are free. Even though we have misgivings, you are forgiving. And in the community of this room, no one made perfect, but in the sharing of our faith to faith, we are made whole. And how we gather, how we sing, how we serve, and how we relate to one another. Jesus, move in this place. Our hearts are open to you.